So not yet. Uh, I'll I'll check with Doctor Nadoj separately. Vishwat, if you can send across the mail to me also, it would be great. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vishwat sir. Yeah, sir. Uh, yes, sir. We will be live in. Uh, we are live, sir. Okay, perfect. So, uh, team, then we'll start the uh, session. I'll uh, arrange for that final panel discussion thing uh, shortly. Uh, so good evening, one and all. Uh, thanks, thank you for joining in for this scientific discussion, which is titled as the Gut Microbiota Forum. Uh, I am Vishwat, and on behalf of Dr. Reddy's, uh, I thank you all and welcome you all for this particular scientific discussion that's going to take place over the next couple of hours. Uh, thank you so much for joining in once again. So uh, just to take you all through, through the meeting agenda, uh, a crisp introduction that will happen uh, just after I conclude this particular session. Uh, after that, we have four spe speakers uh, presentations that is going to take place uh, for a period of 20 minutes each, uh, which is going to talk on the basics of epidemiology, immunology, they're talking about the airway allergies, food allergy. And finally, the speaker sessions are going to conclude on the uh, gut microbiome beyond GI disorders. Uh, and the role of probiotics in the management of allergic diseases. Uh, after this, we have a very interesting uh, probably crosstalk that is going to happen among uh, leading and eminent speakers and faculties from different medical specialities that who have come together to be a part of this uh, program where there's going to be a lot of exchange of ideas, a lot of exchange of thoughts going to happen between uh, various uh, doctor fraternity groups, uh, starting from uh, a dermatologist, uh, an ENT, uh, a, a pulmonologist, as well as a pediatrician who are going to come together. Uh, the session is going to be moderated by, by Dr. Nagraju, sir. And uh, we will have the entire session to be in place so that we are completing the session on time. Um, so these are our esteemed speakers, panelists, and moderators for today's scientific session and talk. Uh, starting with, I will uh, take the uh, names and just a short intro for the same. Uh, we have Professor Dr. H. Parmesh from Bangalore. Uh, sir is a pediatric pulmonologist and environmentalist from Bangalore. Uh, he's a very well-known authority in the space of allergy as well as being he's been part of various uh, WHO initiatives in the management of climate as well. Uh, we also have our moderator and speaker for today, Dr. Major K. N. Nagraju. Uh, so, sir is a consulting pediatrician and allergologist from Chennai. Uh, he's also the vice president as well for the IAP, and it's a privilege and honor to have you, sir, for today's meeting. Uh, we also have Dr. T. Sukumaran, who's a consulting pediatrician, who's also been a past president of the IAP uh, from Kotayam, Kerala. Uh, I welcome you, sir, for this scientific discussion. Uh, our fourth speaker for today is Dr. Vibhu Kavatra, sir. Uh, sir is a, a well-known uh, personality in the space of uh, pediatric pulmonology as well as allergology. He's based out of New Delhi and he's done good uh, intensive uh, experience as well as research in the space of probiotics as well. So he will be talking on the fourth session uh, that will come through. Uh, when I say about the crosstalk, our, our speakers will then be joined by the panel group. Uh, our panel group is a rich group who has got uh, a large amount of experience in their relevant specialties, uh, starting with Dr. Anil Ganju, uh, who is a consultant dermatologist from New Delhi, a very well-known personality in the space of dermatology, who will be experience, who will be sharing his experience uh, in terms of allergy, uh, in terms of what is the role of uh, dermatology and how is it that a dermatology sees these allergies and the management of the same. Uh, we also have Dr. Animesh Tarya, sir, who is a consultant pulmonologist, a very well-known figure across India. Uh, from Delhi itself. Uh, Sir will be also sharing his experience on the role of uh, uh, management of various airway disorders and complications for the same. Uh, we also have Dr. B.P. Tyagi, sir, who is an e ENT specialist from Ghaziabad, who is joined in today. Uh, another senior doctor who will be kind of talking and sharing his experiences and views on the same. Uh, last but not the least, we have Dr. Mukesh Gupta, sir, uh, who is a consulting pediatrician from Jaipur, uh, a very well-known subject matter expert in the space of probiotics as well as allergy as well. He's a, he has a keen interest in the space of allergy. I welcome the entire panelist group today for this uh, panelist and speaker group today for today's session. Uh, without much further ado, uh, I would now like to hand over the session to Dr. Parmesar for the first topic. Uh, sir, I'll just present the slides from my end. Please go ahead. Can you put the slide on? So is it visible? Yeah, visible. Can we widen it up? 
Uh, it's in full screen, sir. Can you make it wide? Uh, sir, I won't be able to do that because it's it's in that pixelated or in, a, in that particular resolution. Uh, okay. All right, I'll try in this one only. Sure, sir. Okay. Uh, my brothers and sisters of my profession, I'm extremely thankful for the ready laboratories, especially Rohit Rathod and the Vishrut Shah for forming this the scientific progress by creating awareness all over India regarding certain subject matters, especially they have taken the root of atopic mars, which start from the gut that they have taken. I'm thankful for that. In this one, they have given me the topic for basics of epidemiology, immunology, allergic disease. I just to sensitize certain issues for you, the magnitude of the problem, epidemiology. And also I bring the greetings for the institute where I'm attached to it now. And I like to dedicate this talk as a matter of fact of all of this program to the COVID warriors and army people and the police people and also the teachers we propagate and uh, bring out the future generation with a lot of devotions. With this type of thing, I like to start on the certain basics of the epidemiology, immunology, allergic diseases, what we have been finding in the country. Next, please. Can I, can I operate? Okay. Well, I think uh, we all know the background of the history. We have to remember, there's no question about it. But we have to understand the past before predicting what going to be happened in future and all this thing. And also historical background, it is, as you know, the first presented with uh, the presenter uh, in 1828, the, the scientists took about nine years to get 28 cases of the hay fever. And uh, later on, A.F. Coco and R.A. Coog, they're the first one to be proposed the atopic march. That's what we're talking about it. And Indian College of Allergy, Asthma, Immunology, he started the Patel Chest Institute in 1966. In 1980, when American Academy of Pediatrics Allergy Chapter started, and 2010, IAP Allergy Immunology started uh, with a lot of efforts, of three years of efforts, heads up to Nagraj and all things. So we started it in Hyderabad, the first place where we started. Now, as you know, all atopy is allergic, but not all allergy is atopic. Next, please. Now, let's look into the atopic march. In general, the clinical features of atopic eczema or food allergy occur first and precede development of asthma and allergic rhinitis later on. The allergic sensitization occurs via the skin or the gut barrier. Every patient may not have or may not manifest all the stages of allergic march, as a matter of fact. There is a timeline for allergic mark. Atopic dermatitis less than one year, food allergy after one year, asthma at 18 months of age, allergic rhinitis after two years. Now there are change the prevalence of the absurd. Even six months have a persistent allergic rhinitis. Our own studies are nearly 10% to come less than one year children persistent allergic rhinitis. And Pakistan study also shows they have found out uh, allergic rhinitis in less than five years and also in children after six months. So things are changing. We are recognizing more often than it used to be before. Next slide, please. So let's look into the allergic march that it understanding. The pediatric allergy is a complex disease of environmental, genomic, and aberrant immune maturation in early life. And it is an epidemic of the 21st century, as a matter of fact. The temporal trend suggests that it is mainly due to the change in the lifestyle, change in environmental exposure, moving away from the traditional food habit, this seems to be there. The earlier what we thought, genetic and all the, now it seems to be very unlikely from the shift of the genetics of the population because European study shows same genetic pattern of six countries has been published in 2020. 
I think which we have observed in 2002, we presented it, urban children suffer more asthma than the rural children, urban children less than 18 years, 16.61%, rural children 5.7%, the same genetic group. I think this is what suggests it is more of the environmental issues causing problem than the, uh, the genetic pattern. Of course, genetics is brick and mortar, environment is an architect to bring out the disease. Having said that, let's move further. Next slide, please. I think, how do we start? Nowadays, people are focusing on stopping the allergic mark, uh, stopping allergic disease and primary prevention they're focusing on. First of all, we have to identify the water risk factor for atopic marks. Then we have to safeguard the first board defense system. That is the safeguard the integrity of the surface epithelium. Three systems are important. Skin is the largest surface area exposed to the nature. And next to the respiratory tract and the conjunctiva. And uh, then we have the gut that are exposed to it. I think protecting the gut barrier is very essential. Gut and lung axis, we are going to focus more on this one. And we like to hear further how to go by. Next slide, please. I think if you look at the allergic disease, which is an earliest onset non communicable environmental disease with a significant psychosocial economic health burden. And it's an epidemic. Actually, atopic dermatitis, allergic rhinitis, and asthma. If you look at before 1800, very rarely we used to see the cases. And as I said, the scientist in the UK in uh, 1828, it took nine years to get about 28 cases of allergic rhinitis, a fever. As the threshold of defense system in us decreased, this, we started seeing the, the allergic diseases. Initially, the rich people used to suffer, then the middle class, now the underprivileged class also suffering the same way, there is no difference. Why, next slide please. Why is it look into that one? Epidemias, respiratory diseases, the communicable diseases significantly coming down. On the contrary, non communicable diseases going up from 35 to 55% the past 26 years, like asthma, allergic rhinitis, and cancer. This is the study from the National Health Profile. Next slide, please. Why is this allergic disease increasing all over the world, more so in India, also, what we've been seeing? The reason to increase allergic diseases, that is the non-communicable, is mainly from the imbalance. We are losing the threshold of protection by way of depriving the protective germs in our environment. Second, changing our traditional food habits, which used to give a lot of protective bacteria, germs. Adapting the Western lifestyle of living, not having good cross ventilation, sunlight, and all those things, a lot of having uh, carpet, whole lot of things causing the problem. The higher exposure, of the triggers, such as air pollution, both outdoor and indoor air pollution, an increased number of viral respiratory tract infections, and less access to the healthcare facilities. In the air pollution, we like to focus predominantly tobacco smoke is the worst variety, and suspended particulate 2.5 micron ozone. These are all three parameters we have to focus on air pollution, global warming, climate change. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at the environmental exposure constituting the prenatal epigenetic changes in immunity, that is the air pollution enhances agriculture, food, and microbiota contribute for early immune programming and development in fetus by epigenetic changes, which has lasting effect on the child's life. Next slide, please. And the impact of the early life nutrition it impacts on the lifelong health of the future of the children. The gene expression can create a metabolic imprint and influence the risk of uh, non communicable disease later in life, like epigenetic and metabolic programming can occur because of the nutrition. And gut microbiome and immune system changes can happen. GI system and digestion and brain and cognition, it will be affected. These are all the recent data from the National Nutrition Institute from the uh, uh, Nestle National Institute of 2021. Next slide, please. The immune development has got a lifelong health. We have to monitor that one. We see the imbalance between the TH and TH1, uh, TH1 and TH2 balance. 
that is the tolerance. There is a skewed TH1, which is an anti-inflammatory, to TH2, which is pro-inflammatory immune response going to happen. And in the beginning, as a colonizer protective germs occurs in the gut from less than one month, from birth to one month, enterobacteriaceae and other bacteria will be there. I think you're going to hear it more often. Later, six months, lactobacillus predominantly, 12 months onwards, bifida of bacteria. These are all the major germs will colonize a different age group. So the monitor our immune system. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I think let's come to the magnitude of the allergic diseases. The airway diseases will take it. Allergic rhinitis in 1994, it was about 22%. Now in the general population, it's gone up to nearly 40% in 2018. Our own data shows. And in allergic rhinitis, the asthma children, allergic rhinitis 70% in 1999. And now it has become almost 99.6%. As uh, Nagaraj says, 100% of the children persistent asthma, they have allergic rhinitis. And asthma has increased in 1979 in Bangladesh, only 9%, steadily increased in 22 decades to 29.5%. Later on, they plateau. And now it is the 19, uh, the 2016 has gone up to 28%. That is Sukumaran studies I showed. But the persistent asthma gone to 20% to 70, that almost to 72%. And uh, the persistent severe asthma has gone to 4% to 11%. The chronic cough, the major cause for that one, allergic airway diseases. So earlier it was to be lower airway, now it's with upper airways predominantly. It was 8% in 1999. In 2017, it got 21.25%. Children coughing more than two weeks were taken. And the comorbidities contribute significantly to the morbidity they have almost 27.5% have allergic conjunctivitis. 27% have got sleep disorder breathing like snoring in the 41%, mouth breathing 45%. And 17% uh, of children have got bruxism. It's the most common cause for allergic problems. And uh, uh, laryngeal dyskinesia, this one thing we have to concern about being treated like an asthma, many an occasion, almost 3.2% of them are having laryngeal dyskinesia. Sleep disorder breathing in the average children is only 8%. Obstructive sleep apnea syndrome is 1.05%. But chronic cough is significantly higher than 27%. Next slide, please. I think uh, most of the headache when the children comes to us, the recurrent headache, we thought it was allergic rhinitis, asthma. We focus predominantly on the, probably from the sinusitis, from the allergic rhinitis, uh, eye watering and eye strain. We are all thinking about it. But recent studies have shown nearly 12.9% of children have recurrent migraine headache. So apart from the sinus-related issue, uh, these recurrent headache children is from the air pollution. Air pollution predominant cause of airway diseases. This one thing we have to keep it in mind. It is published only uh, 15th of this, this month. Next slide, please. I think next look into the food allergy. What is the magnitude of the problem? I think the occurrence of food allergy in the US in adult is only 2.4% in children is 4.8%. Nearly 90% of the food allergy belongs to the eight pictures what I've shown here, the groundnut, egg, crustaceans, milk, fish, tree nuts, wheat, and soya beans. The self-referred food allergy, if you ask the parent to the asthmatic children, does they have anything? Invariably, they're much, they show much higher, this, six times more than what has been, have been, been happening. Food allergy can start with, from the contact of the skin or by inhalation also. You did not eat. Next slide, please. Coming to the dermatological magnitude of the problem, this is Nagaraj and myself who have written in the chapter, in the, uh, in the adolescent and pediatric chapter. Atopic dermatitis, we have been seen in death, 68% of the children. Urticaria lifetime is 7.8 to 22%. Point prevalence is up to 1% of the children. Acute urticaria is 2.5% and chronic urticaria is 0.5 to 5%. These are all the magnitude of the various respiratory diseases, food allergy and skin allergy in children. Next slide, please. So if you look at the various epidemiological data existent in India, children of heavy traffic schools suffer much more than the 
uh, the lower socioeconomic uh, asthma and it further increases lower socioeconomic population. Urban children suffer more than rural children. Asthma increased in summer season in 15 years from 2% to 28.5%. That has been hypothesized as the ozone production and now it has been proved beyond doubt. Traffic police suffer much more, than, double the number than the non-traffic police officer. We have data. Slow traffic generate, uh, if a 10 kilometers per hour, generate six times more of carbon monoxide than 75 kilometers per hour. The asthma visits emergency room increases 100% during the water time because increased sulfur dioxide content at that time in the atmosphere to the bursting of the crackers. Allergic rhinitis and comorbidities, otitis media and sinitis has significantly increased now from the air pollution. Indoor air pollution, if you take it, use of biofuel, ill-ventilated herds change the sex ratio. In pediatric, boys suffer much more than the girls. Here in one incidence, we have seen the girls suffering more because they're helping the mother in cooking in ill-ventilated huts where the agriculture raised as a cooking fuel. Boys will go with the father in the working in the field. This we have found out as a matter of fact. The prevalence of asthma in ill-ventilated houses is 42% and a well-ventilated house is only 8%. Non-commercial -co cooking fuel, if you use the cow dung, uh, wood and all this thing, it is nearly 48, 45 to 48% of asthma is there in those children. If you use electricity, that is the best energy, it's only 1.2%. Single parent, if he smokes, one person smokes in the house is an almost 23%, three times more than the non-smokers in the house. The mosquito coil produces nearly 75 to 100 cigarettes equivalent to carbon monoxide and particulate matter, as a matter of fact. Next slide, please. So what is the economic burden? It is nearly 11.6 billion per year in USA, US dollars, they spend on allergic rhinitis management, only for the anti histamine they spend to 1 billion annually. And uh, so we spend about, uh, uh, these are all the study we did the ARCTM in 2011, rupees 140 billion annually for asthma management and 83,154 million rupees for only cough medicine from the allergic diseases. This is what the economic burden for us. Next slide, please. So how does the airway uh, inflammation comes from, from the viral infection, from the air pollution, whatever it is. It is from the imbalance between the oxidative stress and not having enough antioxidant. This reactive oxygen species produce oxidative stress by which they constrict the smooth muscle and also they increase permeability, leaking of the fluid and impairment of adrenergic receptors, excessive mucus secretion, alter release of inflammatory mediators and airway hyperreactivity and epithelial damage, ciliary inactivity, they will produce. This has to be healing process, it has to be done. Healing process occurs only at night time. Hats off to the third eye, that is the pineal gland situated between the hemisphere. The, the hormone melatonin, what it produces, it protects the body, heals the damage of the tissue. You have to have and produce an antioxidating effect. If you have good nutrition, it helps a great deal. A sleep, a good sleep is essential without any medications. Next slide, please. And also, there is a, the pathophysics, if you look into that allergic diseases, it is an immunological balance, be a TH1 and TH2 uh, 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 lymphocytes. The factors which favor the TH1 lymphocytes are natural environment and farming environment is beneficial, cross ventilated house are good, traditional food habits are good. Early exposure of the tuberculosis, measles, hepatitis have protective effect in allergy. Presence of elder sibling is beneficial. Factors favoring is family history, favoring the TH2 for allergic problem. If the family stay allergies is more, rapid urbanization change the lifestyle of living, Western lifestyle of living. Hygiene hypothesis, not having any protective germs in our environment and change in our dietary habits from traditional food habits to Western lifestyle food habits, a widespread use of antibiotics and pollution for uh, indoor, outdoor, especially tobacco smoke, and volatile organic compound, cooking fuels, exhaust, etc. cetera, and especially rhinovirus and influenza virus, respiratory virus, enhances the airway reactivity in asthma in these children. Nearly 28% of the children develop asthma in these viral infections. Next slide, please. 
the T helper cell is also contributes significantly. So it, it is a balancing, life is a balancing act. Allergy is also life, uh, allergic uh, problem is also balancing act. So, hello, okay. Okay, now T helper cell and you have uh, T suppressor cell, it has to be balanced. If a T helper cell will too many things, more antibodies producing, more killing cells, T suppressors, please don't do it. So there are, we have the T killer cell, T helper cell, T suppressor cell, and T memory cells. The T helper cell, they have got two varieties, TH1, TH2. The TH1 response is only antigenic cell injury it produces. It is stimulated by the cells from the neutrophils and macrophages. And also the Bursal cells also, they stimulated by producing the IgA, IgG, IgM. And response to the infection and other injuries, inflammation come from the TH1 response. If it, too much of inflammation, uh, stimulation of this one causes leads to and insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, Crohn's disease, and multiple sclerosis. On the contrary, TH2 response, it is predominantly B cell uh, plasma cells produce mast cell, lymph, uh, eosinophils, basophil, macrophages, and uh, predominantly they produce IgE here. And it is predominantly a response to the allergy. The innocuous antigens triggers atopic allergy in this situation. Next, next slide. Go ahead, please. So TH1 is for the infection, recurrent respiratory infection and cold. TH2 is allergic rhinitis and asthma. Next slide, please. So the, how the allergic pathway takes about this one slide. The mast cells, the muscle man of the immune system, when they are sensitized with the pre-exposure of the allergen, the antibodies will be surface of the cell will be there. Second time, if there is an exposure happens, exposure happens, then the granules will be released. The histamine is already existent will be released. This decranular histamine releases produce vasodilatation and redness, fluid leakage and swelling of the mucous membrane, nerve irritation from irritates the various uh, nerve, nerve endings. Increase the mucus sucker. Normally, we produce one liter of mucus in the respiratory tract. That will be enhanced and increased. And that we produce as what we call early phase phenomena. Immediately, that produces these things produce watering, uh, rhinorrhea, sneezing, nasal itching, congestion, lower airway produces irritating cough and wheezing. If the continuation happens with the further exposure, then the phospholipidase uh, will come into the picture. Cystinal leukotriene will be coming into the picture. And cellular infiltration happens. Thickening of the mucous membrane happens. Airway remodeling happens. Late phase phenomena will start after three to four hours. Where there is persistent nasal congestion, bronchial constriction, and persistent wheeze will, uh, will occur in these children. Airway, this continues further. Airway remodeling happens. So from the cellular infiltration and hypertrophy of the muscles. Next slide, please. Now, what are the triggering factors? Air allergens we have. 60% is from the house dust mites and cockroaches by 25%. Fungus by 7.5%. Pollens by 7.5%. Pets, 5%. These are all the data we did as a aerobiological, as a principal investigative allergen, these are all the data we collected for the government of India. Next slide, please. So now, pets, I always have a thing. This is what we found in 1979, asthma prevalence in Bangalore was 9%, pet ownership at that time in urban area was 4.25%. In 1999, two decades later on, asthma gone up to 29.5%, pet ownership is only 5%. So I think in 2009, pet owners 25.5%, pet owners, uh, asthma 25.5%, pet owners 5.4%. So I think with these data, there is no correlation relation of pet ownership and prevalence of asthma. Recent studies have shown significant positive impact on the children with allergies, asthma, and social support, social interaction, other people. Many even Gina also suggest if you want to have, have two pets in your house. This is something I want to highlight. We don't have to worry too much about the pets. Next slide, please. I think this is the last but one slide. I think United Airway concept has come into the picture. I think if you look at the asthma, 
Asthmatics have nearly 78 to 99.6% have got allergic rhinitis. Uh, 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 the, the allergic rhinitis, allergic, I'm sorry, this is the other way. Clearly, 100% of the asthmatics have allergic rhinitis and 40% of allergic rhinitis have got asthma. The nasal challenges, allergens, if you challenge them in the nose also, the bronchial hypersensitivity starts at 30 minutes and persists up to 24 hours. Even chemical media, if a challenge happens, even in the lungs, bronchoscopy, if you instill in the nose also, reaction starts. And anatomically, there are similarities, uh, there are differences, uh, they're only not having the muscles and cartilage in the nose. Airway remodel don't happen in the nose. And uh, pathophysiological way, nasal breathing protects, mouth breathing worsens asthma. Bronchial challenge increases the inflammatory cytokines, ke chemical mediators, cellular recruitment in the nose and vice versa. That's what I have mentioned earlier also. Treatment of the allergic rhinitis, it inhaled nasal steroids, improved the asthma, pulmonary function testing, and inflammatory markets also have been appreciated. Next slide, please. Next slide, okay. So the points what one has to take home is in this one, basic, what are highlighted, sensitive, sensitizing the people. The allergic march, can we prevent it? Yes, with our efforts, we can prevent it. We can decrease the allergic risk in future. Primary prevention can happen. But we have to educate the quality education of the children and the parents, the grandparents, other stakeholders, we have to educate them in this context. And the progress of science and collaboration with the practitioner, academician, researchers, and pharma companies very essential. I thank the Redis Laboratories, Rob and uh, Rohit uh, and Vishrut for having taken this initiative to pro enhancing the progress of the science with us. And environment control in our needs, especially tobacco smoke, we have to take care. Traditional food habits we have to encourage with good microbiota. And also nutritionally, Lancet Nutrition and also Donor to India 2019 November, they said you have to have less sugar, any food we are giving in children, less sugar, less salt, low, uh, uh, less oil. This is a must for healthy schools. And also, if you want obesity less, decrease the 10% total intake. This is what the recommendation. Immunotherapy is the only way to prevent allergic mass. Let me assure you about it. A slit is the preferred one in children. And uh, especially oral immunotherapy is more important. The aim to start the before two years of high-risk children, before the maturity immune system. We have been doing after four years. Now they said before two years also as allergy comes, Maybe we have to think in that context. I think we have some research we have to progress in this context. We have to find out the role of synergism, giving the microbiota, immunotherapy, with immunotherapy in food allergy to prevent allergic marks. We have to look into that aspect as a matter of fact, as a synergistic effect it has or not. And we had always infuse hope, trust, confidence in the stakeholders to have a good sleep, without any medication and positive thinking, optimism. Next slide, please. Ladies and gentlemen, a healthy breath. We always bring healthy life. Let each one teach one and plant one tree and maintain it. And we can, we will overcome the air pollution, global warming, decrease the allergic diseases in the future with all the efforts of everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, sir, for yes, your you. presentation and your uh, great talk. Uh, I would now request Dr. Sukumaran sir to present his uh, slide on uh, the diagnosis and management of air load. Can I share the screen now? Sure, sir. So you can just click on resume slideshow. That's uh, the window that is pop up. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> beloved friends, my beloved friends, Dr. Paramesh, Dr. Nagaraju, and other panelists and my dear friends, let me at the outset thank the organizers for giving this opportunity. And the next 20 minutes time, I'll be talking on diagnosis and management of uh, airway allergies. 
Dr. Paramesh has already talked about the prevalent, increased prevalence of allergic disorders in children. We don't know exactly the prevalence is more. Is it due to westernization, urbanization, or can it be explained by the hygiene hypothesis? We don't know. And the two main airway allergies seen in children are allergic rhinitis and bronchial asthma. Allergic rhinitis is an IgE-mediated disease of the nasal mucosa, mainly characterized by four symptoms, sneezing, itching, watery diarrhea, and nasal congestion. And it is the, seen that the major comorbidity in allergic rhinitis is asthma. More than 40% of children with allergic rhinitis develop asthma later. Bronchial asthma is mainly characterized by wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath, and chest tightness. And uh, Dr. Paramesh was telling more than 100%, almost all 100% of children uh, with bronchial asthma will have associated allergic rhinitis. And it's a major socio-cultural and economic burden. And uh, he was just talking about the prevalence. The largest study group which has conducted a prevalence study of asthma is by the ISAC group. If you consider the prevalence of allergic rhinitis in a global scenario, in six to seven years, it is 0.8 to 14.9%. 13 to 14 years, 1.4 to 30.9%. The index study shows that uh, in school-going children, the prevalence of allergic rhinitis is 20 to 26%. Asthma burden, global burden is uh, around 14% in 6 to 14 years, and 27.5 in less than 12 years in Indian data. See, recently I have done a study on prevalence of these allergic disorders in three districts of Kerala, Adapi, Kottayam, and Idiki districts of Kerala. And I have seen that the prevalence of asthma is in nearly 25%. The current episodes of wheezing is nearly 25%, and allergic rhinitis is also very high, nearly 40%. Now, coming to the clinical features, see, the diagnosis of uh, allergic rhinitis and asthma is mainly clinical. It's a mainly clinical diagnosis. And investigations are only supporting. What are the symptoms of allergic rhinitis? As I told you before, uh, these children will present with sneezing, itching, water rhinorrhea and nasal congestion. If more than two symptoms are present for more than one hour per day, for most of the days, at least two weeks, you can make a diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. Along these four symptoms, these children will have other symptoms like watery, watering from the eyes, redness and itching of the eyes due to associated conjunctivitis, nasal sniffing, headache, ear fullness, ear pain, palatal puritus. They will have sleep problems sleep difficulty, bruxism, cognitive impairment, fatigue, and depression. So it seems to be a systemic disease rather than disease localized to nose alone. Then coming to the classification of AR, this classification is very important because the treatment is also depending on the severity of allergic rhinitis. This is what is called an ARIA classification. ARIA stands for allergic rhinitis and impact on asthma. It is uh, classified into intermittent and persistent allergic rhinitis, depending on the duration of illness. And again, it is classified into mild and moderate severity, depending on the severity of the illness. For intermittent, the duration of symptoms will be less than four days per week uh, or less than four consecutive weeks. Persistent symptoms for more than four days per week uh, or more than four consecutive weeks. So it is a rule of four. When coming to symptoms, in children with a mild AR, they, they will have normal sleep. There is no impairment of daily activities, no impairment of work or school. Symptoms are present, but these symptoms are not troublesome. Whereas in children with a moderate to severe AR, the sleep is disturbed, there is impairment of daily activity, impairment of work and school, and they will have troublesome symptoms. So we can have what is called a mild intermittent allergic rhinitis, mild persistent allergic rhinitis, or they can have a moderate to severe intermittent allergic rhinitis and moderate to severe persistent allergic rhinitis. Then depending on the seasonality, one can have a seasonal allergic rhinitis and perennial allergic rhinitis. Depending on the predominant symptom, you can classify this into two groups, runners and sneezes, where the main symptom is sneezing and blockers, but the main symptom is walk mousse. Coming to the main features of asthma, in asthma also, asthma is a clinical diagnosis. 
they will present mainly with the recurrent and persistent symptoms, wheeze, shortness of breath, cough, and chest tightness. And further, if the symptoms are worse at night or early morning, is it exacerbated by viral infections like a rhinovirus infection, human metanuma virus, or a Broca virus infection, or RSV, exposure to dust, mold, season change, dampness, exercise, or stress? And uh, if there's a find out whether there's a relief with bronchiolitis or inhaled steroids. And also, ask a positive history, family history of asthma or other atopic disease, or a personal history of atopy, like allergic rhinitis and atopic dermatitis. So for a clinical diagnosis of asthma, if a child is having more than three episodes of wheezing per year, more than three episodes of wheezing per year, and this wheezing is reversed with a bronchodilator or spontaneously. And the third criteria is you must rule out other causes of wheezing in a child. Especially in children less than five years, there are multiple causes of wheezing in a child. So, more than three episodes of wheezing, wheezing is replaced by a bronchodilator spontaneously. And after excluding other causes of wheezing, you can make a diagnosis of asthma. Now, clearly, the physical findings: when a child is a, is a child without a, without any symptoms, or without any, when the child is perfectly all right, or when a, when a child child is in remission, there'll be no physical finding. And sometimes, when the child is having active disease, there will be a prolonged respiration, bilateral polyphonic wheezes and cackles may be there. There will be use of accessory muscles or respiration with the traction. Chest hyperinflation will be there. Rarely in children with a severe, persistent, uncontrolled asthma, they will sit in a tripod posture with angular shoulders. In this chest epidemiometer may be seen. Classi just like uh, area classification, this is a GINA, mainly GINA guidelines for diagnosis of and classification of asthma. Asthma can be classified depending on the duration of illness into intermittent and persistent. The persistent asthma may be mild persistent, moderate persistent, and severe persistent. The main symptoms we, we look are the, the number of uh, episodes of daytime symptoms, nighttime symptoms, the frequency of use of uh, relievers, and you must find out whether physical activity or restricted or not. And also you can look at PEFR, I'll estimate the PEFR also. And if a child is having less than uh, two episodes per week, it is intermittent, sleep disturbance less than two per week, and the use of relievers are less than two, the children will have an intermittent asthma. In persistent asthma, the episodes are more than two per week, sleep disturbance more than two per month, use of relievers more than two per month. So for allergic rhinitis, you take into the rule of four, and for asthma, this uh, rule of two day. Now there are there are different uh, clinical evidence of allergic rhinitis. You must examine these children very well. This child you can see the allergic sinus, hyperpigmentation, the lower eyelid margin due to venous stasis. These children have various mannerisms. It's called allergic mannerisms. You can see allergic salute. These children will go on rubbing the nose like this, so they can have an allergic salute. And there can be a transverse line here. It's called a Darius line. And ear fingering is more commonly seen. They will have a long eyelash and conjunctivitis, snoring, gasping sleep may be there. Always examine the nasal cavity and look for a turbid hypertrophy. Look for uh, polyps. Look for a cobblestone oropharynx, lymphoid hypertrophy of the pharyngeal wall. They can have associated serous otitis media, lymphadenopathy also. And also look for other evidence of allergy, like a flexural dermatitis, eczema, and articaria. Previously, we thought that uh, asthma is mainly due to a bronchospasm. Later, we thought that the, there is it's a chronic inflammatory disease. Now we see that asthma, children with asthma, they have various phenotypes and genotypes and endotypes. What are the main phenotypes of asthma? The phenotypes may be allergic asthma, which is more commonly seen in 50 to 80 percent of children. There may be an eosinophilic inflammation, IgG level may be high, and there may be a positive atopic history. And these children will respond to inhaled corticosteroid. In non allergic asthma, 30 to, uh, 10 to 30 percent, it is non eosinophilic with poor response to inhaled corticosteroid. Then viral or respiratory tract induced wheezing. This is more commonly seen in children less than 
five years you can listen episodic viral wheeze this children will present is fever followed by recurrent episodes of wheezing and the the fever is triggered uh, by a respiratory virus infection like rhinovirus infection human metanema virus roca virus infection can be triggered and in between the episode this children will be normal then there can be exercise induced asthma aspirin induced asthma and obesity associated with asthma because the phenotyping of asthma is very important uh, because the prophylactic drug the, the controllers may vary with the type of phenotypes uh, this is the phenotyping approach for diagnosis of asthma in children about 2 years of age by the european respiratory society if a child if a child more than 2 years is presenting with the recurrent episodes of wheezing if the child is completely well in between the episode the child is completely well if it is yes are calls the most common respiratory factor if the answer is yes and then you can make a diagnosis of virus induced asthma or episodic viral wheeze is exercise the most common or only respiratory factor the answer is yes exercise induced asthma if the answer is no does a child have clinical level allergic sensitization it can be allergen induced asthma if there is no allergic sensitization is a non allergic or unresolved asthma so we have virus induced wheeze exercise induced wheeze allergen induced wheeze or you can have a multi trigger wheeze and a non allergen induced asthma also now coming to comorbidities of asthma in all children with allergic disorders you must look for associated comorbidities and management of comorbidities is very important look for sinusitis serous otitis media tubal dysfunction adenoid hypertrophy nasal polyposis atopic dermatitis sleep disorder breathing conjunctivitis viral infections laryngeal dyskinesia gastroesophageal reflux disease and obesity comorbid conditions are a rule rather than ex exceptions and always in all children with allergic disorders you look for any evidence of other comorbidities and this comorbidities should be treated for the well control of allergic disorders now coming to diagnostic test diagnostic tests are not very much required for the diagnosis of allergic disease in children especially children less than 6 years it is mainly clinical and laboratory diagnosis only supportive for suspected allergy you can do a eosinophil percentage in the blood absolute eosinophil count or eosinophils in the nasal smear by using a hand salt stain be positive in children with allergic rhinitis for evidence of atopy you can do a total ig total ig estimation is not not a very good investigations for for allergy because in more than 50% of children ig level may be normal and ig level may be elevated due to other disorders like helm helminthiasis or other immunodeficiency disorders ig may be elevated then the specific test is allergen specific ig by in vitro test or in vivo test that should be done before you planning you are planning for an immunotherapy for bronchial obstruction you may can do a spirometry which is a gold standard for diagnosis of asthma in children in adults and children about 6 years pfr mainly helps in the monitoring of children with asthma in small children you can go for an impulse oscillometry the nasal airway resistance can be measured by peak nasal inspiratory flow meter rhino manometry nasal endoscopy airway inflammation can be Uh, look for by exhaled nitric oxide and sputum eosinophils airway hyperreactivity can be found out by the nasal challenge test bronchial challenge test or a conjunctive challenge test a spirometry is a gold standard for diagnosis but it can be done only for children above 6 years so when if you one has been in this for more than 12% after giving a bronchodilator drugs like salbutamol you can make a diagnosis of asthma or if you want less than 80% of the normal is suggestive of an air for obstruction pfr estimation of pfr mainly helps in monitoring of children with asthma so you must know the uh, know the personal best pfr of a child and there's a formula to find out the expected pfr pfr is height in centimeters minus 100 into 5 plus 100 should be the normal pfr of a child then specific test for allergen you can do a uh, skin prick test or you can have in vitro immuno assay, assay can be done in vitro skin prick test is a prerequisite before specific immunotherapy 
the measurement of unbound IgE can be found out by previously was done, done by Ras, Elisa, and RIA. These are older techniques. Currently, the fluorescent enzyme immunoassay is done, or immunochemilucent assay is used. The recent methods are component resolved diagnostic methods are also available now. Now, when you uh, treat a child with a respiratory allergen, you must remember three P's, three capital P's. Most important is prevention of trigger factors, patient education, parent education, decision education. Pediatric education is very, very important, and also pharmacotherapy. I'm not going to this slide. Dr. Pramesh has already discussed this slide. The main area of allergens that is uh, seen are house dust mite, cockroach, fungus, pets, and pollen grains. So I'm not going to the details of the prevention of these things. Then also, you, look, you must look for indoor pollutant and outdoor pollution is very, very important. Next slide. Coming to drugs for treatment of respiratory allergy, for upper airway releases are mainly antihistamines, oral or nasal, nasal decongestant. Upper airway controllers are mainly intranasal steroids and leukotriene receptor antagonists. The lower airway releases are short acting beta 2 agonists like salbutamol, terbutalin, and levosalbutamol, then short-acting antimuscarinic agents like hypertopium bromide. The main controllers are inhaled corticosteroids, long-acting beta-2 agonists, leukotriene receptor antagonists, low-dose theophylline or oral corticosteroid. Now newer drugs have come into the market. A lot of maps are there, starting from amalizumab, nepolizumab, dendrilizumab, all these maps are there in children with persistent asthma. Now, coming to the upper airway releases, it is uh, important to see that you should not use first generation antihistamines. They are not indicated for treatment of allergic disorders because it can produce sedation, impaired cognitive function, and dryness of the mouth because of the anticholinergic effect and tachyphylaxis. So, the drug of choice should be a second generation antihistamines because it has got a favorable efficacy and safety, greater affinity for H1 receptors. Less adverse side effects like sedation, anticholinergic effects, can have additional anti inflammatory effects once a daily dosing is there. There is a long term safety for most of the second generation antihistamines in children above six months. All these drugs should be given only for children above uh, six months. The main drugs are citrosin, levocitrosin, pexafenidine, desiloratidine, and they will have a comparative efficacy in allergic symptoms and is approved for children above six months. Other drugs, bilastin, pexafenidine are least sedative, followed by desiloratidine, levocetrosine, and cetrosine. Levocetrosine and desiloratidine have longer half-life than pexafenidine. The new drug is ibastin and bilastin, which are recommended in children above six years. Other drug is uh, rupachidine, which is a second generation, non-sedative, dual H1 antihistamines. And uh, DCIJ has approved its use in children above 12 years for perennial allergic rhinitis. Then other drugs are intranasal H1 antihistamines. It is effective in reducing symptoms of allergic rhinitis, effective within 20 minutes of administration. The main adverse effects are swamdolence, bad taste, that should be the master taste, and not effective in ocular symptoms. The main drugs are acilastin, nasal spray. And now the combination of acilastin with fruticosone is available. Then and the other is olaptidin, hydrochloride. Mondilocast is the most misused drug now. And mondilocast is uh, now is given by all pediatricians and pulmonologists for children for treating uh, even from rhinitis to allergic rhinitis. It is effective in controlling both upper and lower airway symptoms. As a monotherapy, it may be used in mild persistent asthma and as an add-on therapy in severe persistent asthma. It is effective in case of asthma with co-existing allergic rhinitis, virus-induced asthma, exercise-induced asthma, obesity-induced asthma, and aspirin-induced asthma. It can be given in children above six months. The dose is uh, six months to uh, five years, four milligram. Then six years to 14 years, five milligram once daily. Above 15 years, you can have 10, 10 milligram. But you must be, you must caution the patient regarding the left and right use of Mondilocast. Now it is reported that Mondilocast 
can produce a number of neuropsychiatric manifestations including hyper hyperactivity attention deficit poor cognitive function and also suicidal tendency is reported especially in adolescents who are using mondilucas and also you must not use a combination of mondilucas with antihistamine should not be used and fda doesn't recommend the use of this combination of mondilucas uh, with antihistamines now coming to uh, the controllers in asthma the main controllers is uh, inhaled corticosteroid i will uh, just stress through it's a first line therapy for persistent asthma if quick relief is required for more than 2 weeks time it's be given on a daily basis effective potent and inflammatory effect are there it can reduce the frequency and severity of exacerbation of asthma icc differ in potency and bioavailability the best uh, inhaled corticosteroid available may be budesonide <coughs> and there are three doses scheduled for budesonide low dose medium dose or high dose low dose is 100 to 200 medium dose is 100 uh, 200 to 400 and high dose is above 400 micrograms intranasal steroids as revolutionary the management of allergic rhinitis it is effective for treatment of moderate intermittent and persistent allergic rhinitis over the age of 2 years it is effective for all nasal symptoms and ocular symptoms the high drug concentration is achievable at receptor size in the nasal mucosa with minimal systemic side effects efficacy appears up to 7 to 8 hours of dosing and maximum efficacy occurs up to 2 hours of dosing and uh, when you use an uh, an intranasal steroid you must select an intranasal steroid with least bio availability and highest safety and uh, when you select an uh, inhaled nasal spray the best drug is a mamatasone followed by fluticasone is having the least systemic bio availability of less than 1% when you select an inhaled corticosteroid it may be budesonide or again fluticasone and this is the step up management for children with allergic rhinitis then depending on the severe severity you can start with an oral second generation antihistamines not responding go for intranasal steroid and if it is not effective add an antihistamines or leukotriene receptor antagonist to nasal corticosteroid and as i said before you must look i look for the trigger factors and avoid the trigger factors parent education is important parent education patient education physician education is very important and there is a role for immunotherapy dr parameshwar was uh, speaking about the prevention of atopic mart you can stop atopic mart only by specific immunotherapy those children with a moderate to severe atopic dermatitis if it is if they are given immunotherapy you can uh, stop the atopic mart and this is the uh, uh, guidelines for management of asthma this is uh, adapted from both icons and gina guideline this is what is called a step up management of asthma in step 0 no preventives are required but now the recent gina guidelines 2020 they say that in a step 0 also when you use saba saba should be always combined with inhaled corticosteroid should be a combination of saba with inhaled corticosteroid step 1 inhaled corticosteroid with ltra or theophylline step 2 you must increase the dose of inhaled corticosteroid two times or ics with laba ics with ltra ics with theophylline in step 3 and 4 4 times inhaled corticosteroids 2 to 4 times inhaled corticosteroid with laba ltra or theophylline in step 5 in children above 6 years there is a role for tetrodotum bromide is a long acting anti muscarinic drug or oral corticosteroid and in step 3 and 4 in children with persistent severe asthma there is a role for monoclonal antibody amalizumab or mepolizumab environmental control patient and parent education are very 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 important and when the child is having severe obstructive obstruction you can give a short acting beta to agonist as a reliever but the recent guidelines shows that sprigena guidelines they say that uh, you should not use saba alone in acute episode saba should be combined by inhaled corticosteroid and you now we have seen that those children above 6 years when a child is present in an acute episode of asthma as a reliever you can give a long acting beta to agonist like formotrol formotrol 
acts as a reliever as well as a preventer. So for an acute episode of asthma, with the smart therapy, we can have give a combination of permatrol uh, with uh, uh, with budesonide for acute asthma also. And in the GINA guidelines, there is some role for allergen-specific immunotherapy in step one, step two, and three. You can have allergen immunotherapy. So to conclude, uh, what I want to say is that two common allergic uh, respiratory disorders are mainly allergic rhinitis and asthma. There are problems in this throughout, uh, throughout, throughout the world. And uh, the diagnosis is mainly clinical. Look for clinical symptoms. And uh, also, laboratory evidence is only support, supportive. Laboratory evidence is mainly, su mainly supportive. It's a diagnosis is mainly cl clinical. And in the management of all the allergic disorders, you should just remember three capital P, pharmacotherapy, prevention of trigger factors, patient education. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your elaborate and excellent talk. I would now request uh, uh, Professor Major Nagraju to kind of take over the next session, please. I think I'm very thankful to all of you for giving this opportunity to me. I'm very uh, Professor Dr. Parmesh Sar and Dr. Sukumar and another my friends. I am not practicing pediatrics, what uh, Redis Laboratory people told. I'm allergy immunologist. I don't practice pediatrics at all. That's why I want to tell you. Uh, introduction, that is a food allergy I'm going to talk. I'm not going to talk about immunotherapy, but I'm going to talk about food allergy immunotherapy, that is oral immunotherapy. I finish exactly 20 minutes. You know that the prevalence of allergy diseases are increasing, especially in infants. We are seeing a lot of this cosmic protein allergy. And whereas allergic diseases are increasing 20 to 30 percent all over the India, I think. There is a second wave of food allergies going to come because recent study done in Europe overall, we know that a lot of people are sensitive to that. It may any time like a bomb, it may come out. That's one thing what I want to tell you. Roughly around 6 to 8 percent of the food allergies in children we are seeing. Food allergies are the cause of asthma in 5 percent of the patients. What are the food allergies? We normally use a broad term for everything. That is food adverse reactions. Subgroup is only food allergies. Food allergy adverse reaction divided into immune mediated, non-immune mediated. Immune mediated, again Ig. This is a portion what we are normally concentrating. That is the Ig, non-Ig mix and cell mediated. That I'm going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk on non-immune mediated, which is mainly lactose intolerance and caffeine and scrombide push toxicity and idiopathic sulfides using and all these things and coloring agents and all these things we are going to talk about that. There are Ig mediated, all of you might be heard about Anaphylaxis, it can present as a pollen food syndrome, food induced asthma, food dependent excited induced anaphylaxis, and food induced attic area, and all these things. Non IgE and is protein induced enterocolitis syndrome, proctocolitis, and celiac disease, and there is inner syndrome and dermatitis epidermis. This is the only thing. Only pediatrics see a lot of proctocolitis in our practice and see like this is both in children and adults we are seeing nowadays. Atopic dermatitis mixed that what we use normally we present as IgE and also T cell both it can come like allergic isnophilic gastritis, allergic isnophilic esophagitis, allergic isnophilic gastritis these are the things both will be there. What is the prevalence of food allergy? Mainly cow's milk is very common in India we see in younger the child we see more and more cow's milk protein allergy and egg allergy and wheat allergy is very less what we see and most of them are overgrow and fish, shellfish, peanut, tree nut is not overgrow. Of course, peanut allergy we won't see much in this part of the country. Phenotypes of food allergy, you have to know about this thing. This is the thing what we see mainly. That thing what the transient food allergy that what I told you is the milk and wheat. Whereas a persistent food allergy, what I told about the peanut and fish and all the thing, 
food dependent excise and and you know anaphylaxis i'm going to talk about few words about there is another one is called allergy food allergy may be exaggerated by nsaid dependent and all call dependent this is a very important thing you won't develop anything but you are taken nsaid there food allergy may manifest and people think it is maybe nsaid but not it's not due to nsaid your threshold will go down and intermittent cross react to that is the main thing what we used to tell oral allergy syndrome cross between the one allergen to other allergen that is one thing and nowadays people talk about the gal alpha gal syndrome that is beef that is not seen much in this part of the country more in the north america north and pole only we used to see mainly and sensitized is non reactive but you are sensitized but you are not reacting to that thing that we see a lot of plenty of people when you do skin prick test we see fine but you are not reactive at all that's only thing but the airline sensitization nowadays we are seeing especially food airlines baker sas and all everyone knows about cross react to also we can able to know about that common foods what about our study this is my book uh says that infants cow's milk and adolescent mainly prawns and shellfish crustaceans is common nowadays we are reporting lentils especially chickpea and other dogs we are getting more and more in school children and adolescents this girl radhika came with arteria angioedema i got a severe attacks off and on two episodes of anaphylaxis also she admitted and treated for anaphylaxis and sent to us there is a family history of allergy also there definitely there are total ig levels though it is not useful but it was very high when we did that thing she had got prawns but uh, positive was very high prawns and of course cross reactive is uh, dust mite is cross reactive when you ask the patient the patient say that we really, i never taken prawns but when she always tell that when we go to the hotel only the satigere angioedema and anaphylaxis happens the contamination of the food itself in the vessel what it cooks that itself is more causing the allergies for this food induced anaphylaxis this girl kritika came to us recurrent attacks of fatigue anaphylaxis several times so many times and she is to take to the hospital and she is to give normal therapy last they gave adrenaline and they are not responding to it they gave an iv adrenaline only they gave and reviewed that thing and asked the patient to send back to us when we did gluten is very high see that from we have to hear gluten and specific age of gluten was very high the wheat also went very high then we asked that she is telling i am taking parotta every time not happens but when you take the parotta or any gluten items and exercise she is getting positive then we did excise test alone not positive and then we are given the parotta what she is to eat and develop and did excise test is positive that is food dependent excise induced anaphylaxis so what advice we given is not to take gluten containing foods Uh, for four hours. This is the thing what we produced in the best paper award we got in European Academy of Allergy. We got 15 cases of food dependent. Now around 22 cases of food we have found out in excise dependent anaphylaxis. Very very common nowadays. We must look for that. What is the symptoms of IG mediated food allergies? JT is a very thing what people used to expect. Skin is common. Atigere angioedema is there. Exacerbation of atopic dermatitis we used to see, and itching also there, and vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, cramp it and vomit, and immediately after a few hours we will develop diarrhea. Respiratory wheezing we can occur. Anger the child more and more we can able to get, and anaphylaxis symptoms this can all all can occur. Well, how do you diagnose food allergies? Food allergies mainly diagnosed by history. especially when it is happened what happened actually sequence of events to be after ingestion length of the period you got given amount how much is given is very important and resolution of symptoms and after start after stopping that thing it has to resolve and then once reintroduction is has to happen again that is the one thing what is really needed for that how do you investigate most of them are negative predictive value if you have patient a lot of patients come with the i got this food pursued food allergies are very hard in children they come to us and then you do the skin prick test 
that patients say that most of them are, if you negative spin prick test, then it will definitely indicate that patient is have uh, a negative to four. If positive, maybe 58, 55 to 58 percent. Immunocap, that is the one thing gold standard for in vitro test that we can be useful for that. And specific IG for measurement of food, it is almost as good as skin prick test. And another one is got prick to prick test. A lot of patients come with, I am allergic to this. You, I, you are telling, I don't believe. And you can able to prick and then prick it and you can show to that. Now, most of the important thing has come that the component di component resolved diagnosis, CRD has come big way and we are the only people in the country or maybe even SARC countries doing components. Nobody else is doing components. What happened the component? Which one is the causing allergy in the component in the allergen we have to know. The casein is a very thing very important. Even if it boiled, nothing will happen to that. And it persists for a long time. That we have to find out. Whereas the lactalbumin, like a beta globulin, if you boil it and they will be, uh, they are not allergenic. That's why we have to know which type of the component causing allergy we have to know about. Like peanut, ARA2 is a causing severe anaphylaxis for that we have to prescribe uh, EpiPen. This boy has come to us uh, from Nagarpoil nearby Chennai, from near in Tamil Nadu and near to Kanyakumari. And when they came with milk levels are called 26.5 specific IG. We followed up the chain, which is coming down. So the requirement of the uh, milk challenges will not occur at all. The nowadays, most of the people not doing, we are also stopped doing the milk challenges nowadays. Only milk challenge I do for the giving oral immunotherapy only, otherwise you won't do the immunotherapy at all. So this child has come back now and now it is 0 0.5. So after two years, we say that he's overgrown. Now he's taking able to take all the milk products. Another child from neighbor part of the country, Andhra Pradesh, he has come to us with the Milk, same milk allergy with more than 100. So egg allergy is more than 100. When all the time 100 only, it is not going, it is a persistent allergy and you may not overgrow. And we have to tell the patient too, whether after two years also, it's not going down. Maybe plan for the immunotherapy, oral immunotherapy or whatever, maybe sublingual immunotherapy. This another girl is came with a recurrent abdominal crying. This boy has come, my one of my classmates, brother's son, he has come rec recurrent loose stools, failure to thrive, recurrent abdominal pain, vomiting, and he has got also allergic rhinitis. The family stuff, uh, asthma is there. And we did here endoscopy and biopsy, and there is definitely shows 75% uh, isnophils are present, and child has got gluten positive also. So this is allergic isnophilic enteritis, we found out and ask them to stop the gluten diet. And we did a challenge also, and he's getting severe abdominal pain with the gluten. So my dear friend, what I'm telling you is both the T-type, T-cell and E and IG mediated both the type of this thing. And after stopping the change, started gaining weight and doing very well. What are the investigation for non-IG mediated? How many non-IG we're going to tell about? Is that thing I told you, endoscopy is the main important thing and you have to find out ulcers. There is a hypertrophy, lymphoid hypertrophy you can able to find. And then isnophils, more than 20 isnophils is a diagnostic feature of non ig mediated food allergies. Mainly what you how do you diagnose food allergies by elimination for 14 days and re-challenge with the same food. And then it looks very easy to talk but very difficult to do because several foods we have to stop one by one and one by one we have to do, whichever the child presents we have to do. At that time, 14 days, a lot of nutritional problems also. We ask the patient to maintain the diary, food diary, with that also we can able to find out. There are, this is a non-IG commonly we see, uh, PIPs, that is nowadays a lot of cases are occurring very young children, especially one month and two months of children are coming, the protein, good protein induced anthropogenic, we used to see a lot of cases, these are all self-mediated, profuse vomiting, diarrhea and dehydration shock, just like it looked like a sepsis. Another one is proctocolite, we used to see plenty of pediatrics and see is the blood in the mucus and anemic patient, uh, but th thriving very well. Another cases I told you, anthropathy, the same as like other things. 
this girl has come from uh, siliguri to us in apollo children's where i am apollo consultant both hospital both uh, adult and pediatric eye school doctor and the child has come with a recurrent abdominal pain from this thing and they went to cmc and they found out for celiac investigate they didn't find anything everything normal biopsy and histopathology normal when they come to us and we that i asked uh, gluten to be eliminated because it fit it into the non celiac gluten that's the only thing what is non celiac gluten everything behave like a celiac but all the test may be negative then we, they, she is doing extremely well now what are the comorbidities of food allergies lot of comorbidities what you are telling you have to look for all these things when a patient comes with you there are a lot of foods cross react with the pollens that you have to identify that's why whenever a lot of patients comes to you that i am allergic to this fruit but he may be allergic to the pollen that you have to understand that thing. so how do you manage management of ig mediated there are two options you wait allergen avoidance wait for few months at least i feel that one year if child is improving very well okay spontaneous resolution okay if not then go for immunotherapy that's the only thing what anaphylaxis you have to wait for long time whereas uh, other things like asthma or other you have to wait for only 6 months of course this is the one what we uh, devised because epipen is not available we load the adrenaline 0.3 because adrenaline is a very light sense to that's why we cover in the uh, spectacle box and give to the patients all immunotherapy my patients all the uh, uh, anaphylaxis patients i got a lot of fire ant allergy patients all there are mastocytes patients all will be given their three i do and they use it whenever they require otherwise avoidance is the best answer for that this girl kriyakrish has come to us with a recurrent anaphylaxis mother says that even she not able to tolerate even the even touches also child will develop articular rashes when we did specific ig 20.4 and skin test positive and food challenge test 1.5 ml only she gets immediate and we started a we started a uh sub uh, sub sublingual immunotherapy is followed by oral immunotherapy that is called soti nowadays and we are the only people doing in asia specific oral tolerance induction and child is tolerating now child is taking 400 ml can you believe it that is the thing these are the other child how to give and all oral immunotherapy we are giving this girl came to from abu dhabi that with uh, breathing difficulty and all these things uh, only exposed to the milk and milk products even cooking somebody else she used to run away and she even she had got lactobacillus bacillus anaphylaxis if you given somebody given pro probiotic went into anaphylaxis that child has come to us and that is the way milk see how big it is and we started uh sublingual immunotherapy the patient is from long distance now it is that is coming down now it is around 20 31 Uh, from 100 it is coming to 31 point now child somebody she prepares her own tea and she won't take others she will give to the thing and she is even wafers she is able to tolerate this is the case we present in european academy of allergy and clinical immunology sublingual immunotherapy and everyone appreciate this is a specific oral tolerance so tea i think this is a one thing everybody in europe inquired us how you are doing and all other forms of immunotherapy falforzia is the one thing which is approved for peanut allergies in india in abroad you see and now it is nestle controlled and epicutaneous immunotherapy is almost cow's milk protein or peanut allergy become very popular and uh, waiting for the uh, fda approval subcutaneous immunotherapy lot of trials are going for the food allergies also what about probiotics probiotics is amnos gg likely to be very good for the it mediated cow's milk allergy we are doing one study with amnos gg with oral immunotherapy we give amnos gg and we want to see a lot of complications with oral immunotherapy that can be reduced with that because most of my patients take at least 6 to 7 times adrenaline while on immunotherapy oral immunotherapy 
lot of nutritional deficiency occurs during the food allergies that is the one thing when you stop the food any food lot of deficiencies can occur you can see and you have to substitute with the other food or you have to substitute whatever may be there b complex or uh, and calcium and other things iron all the things you have to supplement what is the natural is lot of people think that as asthma or was in children like the food allergies or only 69% of cow's milk allergy or go by 10 years now the lot of shift is happening it takes a long time and soya also same almost and egg also same almost we we tour most, most of the times and these are the things never over go at all most of them will persist for long time that is one thing crustaceans and peanuts and tree nuts and all persist for long time this one really really changed our uh, way of approach that is the leaf study that is learning early about introduction of peanut so all the patients who are babies have got eczema or mothers have got allergy the children born they started peanut at 4 to 11 months of age and they found out that uh, reduced development of peanut by 86% is quite huge and compared to the placebo other things they are not uh, uh, things so what happened they are doing up to 5 years leaf on study that is called but they found very good but by seeing that thing in uk same study as that is called each study inquiring about tolerance and with common six foods but they didn't find very effective all the foods except peanut and egg that's why people are telling that peanut and egg to be started four months of age whereas others didn't have any data coming to the conclusions food allergy is a subset of large group of adverse food reactions common age foods causing food allergies are milk egg and lentils and oral allergies to be due to the cross reactive fruits and vegetables and with pollens history is a very important thing and skin prick test specific guys along with the oral challenge test we can able to diagnose most of the food allergies oral and sublingual immunotherapy is promising which you are not going to overgrow parent education and avoidance of the offending foods along with the adrenaline loaded adrenaline may be very helpful for prevention of food allergy when complications of food allergy food induced anaphylaxis must carry epinephrine most of the children with allergy to milk egg soya and wheat will overgrow whereas the peanut tree nut and fish and shellfish are usually lifelong and most of the people there is in children at after 6 years they will go to school and they uh, accidentally they take that is a one of the important thing sublingual immunotherapy what we treat that even if you exposed to the ac accidentally they may not develop anything thank you very much for this this is my book where i wrote a probiotics in allergic disease one of the second edition this one and it is uh, it is not available at all such a way it is completely disappeared within a week time and thank you very much for this opportunity given to me and and thanks for all the things thank you thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much for this presentation uh, i would now invite uh, dr vibhu sir for the final session which will be the speaker session on the gut microbiome and the role of probiotics in the management of the same um just for the announcement uh, as a housekeeping announcement we are slightly behind schedule by say for 10 15 minutes so we would try to catch up uh, of the same uh, post completion of this session uh thank you very much uh, can you see my screen yes sir you just need to put it on full screen or uh, slide show more okay so uh, thank you very much for uh, the excellent session which has been going on and i think a lot of uh, part uh, which i wanted to cover has already been covered so i was you know uh, skipping some of the slides so i removed some of them anyway so i'm going to uh, concentrate mainly on the gut uh, microbiome beyond uh, gi disorders and the role of the probiotic so if you see uh, so i've got to skip uh, most of the slide because if you see that uh, uh, this has already been covered that you know it has been hypothesized that uh, certain intestinal bacteria produce compounds that are useful against premature aging so here comes uh, the point of uh, the gut access you know the role of the gut in uh, certain things which has uh, there for the premature aging because that has been there in our uh, century old books also 
so if you see the gut of a newborn in is sterile and is uh, gradually colonized by environmental bacteria now there is a known difference between children which are uh, who are born vaginally and through cesarean section you know as we all know that uh, those who are born vaginally are exposed to certain bacteria which are actually the good bacteria while in cesarean section there is a delay in the colonization of bifidobacteria the lactobacilli and the bacteroides in the gut now the breastfeed children will have a higher growth and activity of bifidobacteria and lactobacillus than those who are fed with the formula now growing concern in the disease i think this part of it uh, has already been covered so i'll just skip up this slide that there is uh, just that in short there is an increase in the allergic diseases which is occurring in our country so probably as uh, already mentioned you know it's uh, just that the things are changing in the last 20 years the things have changed and uh, earlier which used to be around 5% has now gradually increased to about 40% or even more allergic march has already been covered so now i'll directly come to the hygiene hygiene hypothesis now this part has also been covered but uh, i would like to just inform so we ha we have the th1 activity and the th2 activity so whenever there is an increase in the th2 activity there is ige release and uh, there are allergic disorders so how i explain it to my patients in a very practical way is that look why why has allergy been there or you know there are parents who come to us and say that you know the father had allergy but it was not as bad as the child has so why is it occurring so you have to explain them in very simple words that the food habits the uh, environmental habits things have changed the use of antibiotics has increased and uh, apart from that the exposure to the diseases have also decreased as a result of which you know this is how we explain this is what the hygiene hypothesis is and there is an increase in the th2 activity so there is uh, there uh, so this is something which becomes easier for us to explain that uh, in the developed nations the already the allergy was there in a much much uh, higher level as compared to the developing nations so the reason that we are now moving towards the developed state is why the allergy load is increasing so the hy hygiene hypothesis mainly developing countries uh, have uh, large family size rural homes livestock intestinal microflora uh, is variable transient and so we have a low antibiotic use then high helminthic burden and poor sanitation higher or orofacial burden fecal burden so as compared to it the western countries there are small family sizes they are affluent they are urban homes so this is what i was telling in my last slide that we are moving from the developing towards the developed things so it may be good from a certain angle that look it looks developed but the thing is that we are moving towards a state where we are going to have more of the non communicable disease which is the allergy which is going to be there because there is good sanitation and there is a higher antibiotic use also if you see an affluent patient uh, you don't give an antibiotic and the patient is like uh, after sec uh, after about uh, 24 to 48 hours he starts panic panicking even for a viral infection he wants to take an antibiotic while in the lower strata if you if the patient you convince the patient the patient is ready to wait even for 5 to 7 days that's what makes the difference microflora hypothesis i think this has already been covered the uh, the uh, point of uh, disbiosis which is there so what happens in case of uh, the breast milk versus formula as i already mentioned the breast milk is the best milk and uh, it gives the good bacteria the uh, the birth mode makes a difference because uh, the later uh, because in case of the cesarean sections uh, as already mentioned there is a delayed uh, colonization of uh, bifidobacteria and the lactobacillus then infection so now infection again uh, plays an important role because uh, as you know already mentioned the th1 and the th2 hypothesis which is there so here <clears throat> the microflora hypothesis came, comes into role that uh, if you're going to have the small infections the the uh, uh, the local infections which are going to be there that's going to decrease the th2 and uh, that would actually uh, make the uh, person more towards the th1 as a result they're going to be lesser uh, allergic uh, conditions the antibiotic exposure already mentioned that more the antibiotic exposure the more is going to be the disbiosis household size and for uh, pet exposure this has already been mentioned so once you're going to have so you know we we talk of uh, a disbiosis and a eubiosis so one is that this is the normal gut a normal gut has certain bacteria which are our friends which are there as a part of the normal uh, uh, flora of our uh, gut which uh, helps in absorption as well as uh, helps in maintaining 
a certain level, a certain degree of immunity. While a dysbiotic flora is going to be when they're going to be repeated infections with repeated exposure to antibiotics and everything. So that basically uh, makes the person more uh, moves a uh, move to more towards the allergic side. Now the TH1, TH2 imbalance has already been mentioned that when whenever there's going to be a decrease in the TH1 uh, uh, thing, there's going to be increase in the TH2 bias. So there's, there's going to be TH2 bias response and increased Ig and probably inflammatory cytokines will increase. So then you know this is basically a kind of a rotation which is ha going to happen more of TH2 and less of TH1, and this the person is going to be more allergic. So now coming to the evidences on association between TH1 and TH2 imbalance and higher IgE. So in the Nelson's textbook of pediatrics, also it has been mentioned that the TH2 cytokines are important vector molecules in pathogenesis of asthma and allergic diseases. Acute allergic reactions are characterized by infiltration of TH2 cells into affected tissues, which causes an increase in the level of IgE and results in the allergic disorders. So role of, uh, so this is one of the study, which is the role of uh, uh, the epithelial cells in development of asthma and allergic rhinitis. Now here, if you see the uh, thymic uh, seismic lymphoprotein is capable of directing the dendritic cells towards a TH2 response, providing an essential link between epithelial cell activation and allergic type of inflammation. So this is basically a link between the epithelial injury and generation of allergic type inflammatory response. So uh, this again uh, is going to tell us about this is basically uh, uh, we can correlate it uh, with the gut lung axis. So now coming to the role played by another this another study which is there where again there is a recent evidence which suggests that the allergen type two helper cells play a triggering role in the activation of recruitment of Ig antibody producing B cells mast cells and eosinophils. A reduced microbial exposure in early life is responsible for shift of Th1, Th2 balance. So, you know, it is a very easy thing to explain to the parent. Uh, in simple words, we can also tell the parent that, look, you, your child has an immune system. Now, this immune system is somehow, you know, what, what I tell a patient is that your child has an immune system, which is a spoiled kid kind of a thing. So that spoiled kid, kid has to be put into some work. So if you're going to put in something which is constructive, then the child's immune system, you have to direct that immune system into a particular uh, way. As a, otherwise, it's going to start hitting onto things where it should not hit on. That's the very basis of allergy, that your immune system starts responding to things which are uh, normal in your environment. So that is something which we have to tell the parent that this is what actually happened and this is the reason why your uh, child started having allergy issues. Now, treatment of allergic asthma modulation of TH2 cells and their responses. Now, here the atopic asthma is a chronic inflammatory pulmonary disease, which is characterized by recurrent episodes of wheezy labored breathing with underlying TH2 mediated inflammatory response. Now, here, if you see that if you if there is a reduction or elimination of uh, allergen specific TH2 cells, that will reduce the consequences of repeated allergic inflammatory responses, such as lung remodeling without causing a generalized immunosuppression. So here, uh, the anti-inflammatory drugs, the corticosteroids, leukotriene modifiers that were being used in this study, and it was uh, taken into account that once you decrease the TH2 response, uh, obviously there is an Im uh, improvement in the patient. Now, preferential expression of TH2 types chemokinase receptor in atopic dermatitis. Again, in this study also, there is a complete, uh, the same thing that it is basically, again, the imbalance between the TH1 and the TH2. So it is just that the TH2 type cytokines, such as uh, the, uh, the tissue, uh, the thymus activation and uh, activation and regulated chemokine, which are involved in the pathogenesis of the skin lesions in the allergic dermatitis patients, through the preferential recruitment of the TH2 cells. Again, the TH1, TH2. So again, the same thing comes into force that whether it's the allergic rhinitis or the atopic dermatitis, it is basically the imbalance between the TH1 and the TH2. And the basically because of the TH2 part, there is allergic uh, rhinitis as well as the atopic dermatitis. Now in this study, again, the immunological hallmark uh, is a TH1, TH2 disbalance. Again, here also, it was the same thing that the TH2 cytokine interleukin-4, 
is uh, it is necessary for the th uh, the for the ige synthesis as a result of which there was atopic dermatitis so now I, uh, the th1 th2 imbalance and high ige are associated with development of the allergic disorders so existing therapy has already been spoken about that we have antihistaminics we have corticosteroids leukotriene inhibitors decongestants mast cell stabilizers and anticholinergics but now a new thing which has come is by use of the probiotics now here uh, i would like to mention that the very definition of probiotics is that it has to be a live bacteria or a live yeast but uh, here we are going to be using uh, the uh, i'm going to be talking of the role of the killed bacteria in uh, the allergic disorders uh, which are going to be there <clears throat> so now there are certain strain specific probiotics have shown its role in allergic disorders by addressing the th1 th2 imbalance and controlling the ige level at the end of the day what we need to control is the the imbalance between the th1 and th2 has to be controlled as a result the ig level will be controlled and eventually our uh, allergic diseases would be in a controlled zone so now there are two probiotic stains which were being studied one is uh, the lactobacillus paracasi gmnl133 and lactobacillus fermentum gmn090 both uh, the it is basically what is available is a mixture of these two strains and uh, two billion cells of each so heat killed technology again uh, uh, as i already mentioned that you know the very definition is of pro probiotic is that of a uh, of a life here i'm going to i'm also going to talk of the uh, that, that there is no statistical per se difference between the heat killed technology which is being used and uh, the live bacteria so the mixture of uh, life lactobacillus paracasi and lactobacillus fermentum is uh, taken heat application at uh, 70 degrees heat kill lysophilization is being done and then heat killed in form of aap2 which is being there so it is a synergistic combination of heat killed probiotics it is a unique technology to make probiotics stable even at a high temperature and it's a basically a patented technology now what happens is that the live probiotic material gets killed at a high temperature without affecting its cell cellular integrity now due to maintenance of the cell integrity the anti allergic and the immunomodulatory component remain viable for the action so the heat kill technology advantages it is uh, it is more stable because uh, when it's there in the market when it's there in uh, the environment it is much more stable and especially for the indian climate where the variation is very high especially in the northern india regions then intracellular integrity during gi transit is there and there is immunomodulation now mechanism of action of ap2 corrects the th1 th2 imbalance and thereby reduces the ige by the the tocoic acid which is uh, there in the dendritic uh, 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 the bacterial cell wall of the AAP binds with the toll-like receptors in the Peer's patch of small intestine, and it activates the dendritic cells. The dendritic cells then activates the Th0 cell, increase in the EGF beta, interferon gamma, and IL10. That basically results in the increase in the Th1 activity and uh, the decrease in the Th2 activity, which reduces the IgE release. It's as simple as We are kind of giving a controlled infection into the system so that uh, it, there is more recruitment of the Th1 as compared to to the Th2, and eventually there is a decrease in the IgE levels and the control of the allergic uh, symptoms. Now coming to the clinical trials which were being done, so now treatment of perennial uh, allergic rhinitis with the uh, lactic acid bacilli. now this uh, clinical trial one uh, it was basically to uh, for the effect of paracasi in fermented milk to improve quality of life in patients with allergic rhinitis it was a randomized double control style uh, placebo controlled trial now it had a uh, treatment uh, group had uh, uh, 60 and uh, the placebo were 20 and 2 billion uh, cfu daily were given for a period of 30 days this is basically published in pediatric allergy and immunology 2004 they are basically the older trials which are there because uh, there there not much of new trials which is there so here the patient uh, more than 5 year of age per, uh, perennial allergic rhinitis for more than 1 year and the modified uh, pediatric rhino conjunctivitis quality of life questionnaire was used for no symptoms eye symptoms practical issues uh, other symptoms activity limitation as well as the quality of life 
Overall, the results showed that there was a significant decrease in the nasal symptoms, the eye symptoms, the practical issues with the patient, as well as the other uh, secondary symptoms which were associated with the disease. So even the quality of life and uh, the, the symptom uh, frequency scores were also improved. So the treatment with lactobacillus paracase significantly reduces severity, frequency of allergic rhinitis, improves quality of life, has a good safety profile. Coming to another trial which was there, it was to evaluate the efficacy, safety, and immunological effects of Paracasey LP33 in patients with might induced perineal allergic rhinitis. Again, it was a randomized double blind placebo controlled with 57 patients more than six years of age having perineal allergic rhinitis for more than one year. Again, here uh, the Galactobacillus Paracasey uh, LP33, there were 41 patients and 16 were. For the placebo it was a 12 week treatment period and four weeks of follow-up period which was there that is a total of 16 week study which was there this was uh, done in 2008 so here there was again uh, without treatment and uh, with uh, with treatment there was a statistical significant difference between uh, the patients in uh, for the patients with where there was a reduction in the nasal symptoms eye symptoms practical problems, other problems, activity, and overall score. So over the period of time, there was a decrease in the symptoms. And another thing which was being found was that a total of uh, the, this uh, here, uh, the total treatment was given for about 12 weeks and uh, the symptoms uh, uh, were assessed up to about 16 weeks. So additionally, there, this beneficial effect remained significant even four weeks after the discontinuation of this probiotic supplementation. So do probiotics need to be alive? Now, this is something which is a question, which is the very practical question, which uh, always comes to me because whenever I uh, give any presentation or wherever I try to support this, this is a question which always comes up. So there, this, there was a study where uh, here it was reviewed that the evidence that the heat killed ultraviolet inactivated and even components of these agents may be just as effective and considerably safer for the host. So agents that are heat killed or UV inactivated and even components of these agents may be just effective. Now here I try to explain to somebody in a very simple words that you have vaccines which are also again uh, which are basically not really live vaccines. They are heat, uh, they are killed vaccine or live attenuated vaccines which are there. Or the kill vaccines also there and there are even uh, component vaccines which are there so they are also very effective so if a vaccine can be effective so can the bacteria be because we are trying to use only certain properties of bacteria we don't want an active bacteria to be present uh, for its property to be utilized completely mm -hmm. so effect of uh, live versus heat probiotics on acute diarrhea in young children there were no significant differences which were found in uh, th this uh, uh, article which was published in uh, uh, the Pediatricia Indonesiana. So coming to my experience, in simple words, I've seen about uh, about four to 500 patients I've uh, put on uh, this uh, AAP2 and uh, over the period of last four years. So it was basically, it was launched somewhere around 2016. And since then, uh, February 2016, I've been using it. I gave it in a BD dose and I gave it for a period of about one to three months to the patients, especially during the uh, seasonal area uh, times when I know that during a particular season, this uh, issue might be there. So somebody having a very seasonal uh, allergic rhinitis during say about uh, December, November, December, I try to start it a month before and I try to give it a month later than the usual period when it is expected to exacerbate. So in place of Montelukast, in very few cases, so I usually use it as an add-on therapy so that we don't land up with exacerbation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vibhu, sir, uh, for this. Uh, I would now um, invite all the panelists and the speakers to be a part of the uh, panel discussion that will happen now. Uh, Dr. Nagaraju, sir.
start with that everyone knows that human microbiome this is one thing everywhere it is there not only i think you are human uh, you you are microbiome more than your cells i think that's the one thing human colon itself tend to for 11 bacteria i think everything is controlled by our own bacteria i can tell you what i am taking at acrolimus i am a renal transplant person you know that thing my acro levels are off and on i want to the literature and so much as that you know so much change is going on you find that rectum there is a one uh, microbiome i forgot the name i was remembering every time you can find out that is a cause for my disturbance in tract levels so the day will come everything will be controlled by microbiome in the gut i can tell you the day will has to happen everywhere it is that micro microbiome is very what are the current microbiomes used as a probiotics there are a lactobacillus and bifidobacterium now common used all over the world completely and of course there are other uh, species also used in lot of the places now we come to the panel which questions anyone can take up because i am not able to see their faces because this is fully covered full screen i made it what are the probiotics anyone can take the issue so basically probiotics are uh, live uh, bacteria microorganisms whether it's bacteria or uh, the fungi which are there and uh, which are a part of the food and it helps in maintaining the uh, you know the, the basically the gut microflora in a better way i mean it's it's like a huge in, for uh, basically having a u biosis I think that's the way what you told me. That microbiome is the original definition. Now, eat killed probiotics become very famous now for especially for the respiratory allergies become very very. Now people are talking about that ETB based tech, uh, that technology from where people have got it and they are doing a lot of work on that. What are prebiotics? Anyone can take up that prebiotics. Uh, probiotics are basically nutrients on which uh, these probiotics feed so these are the supporting elements and nutrients which helps prebiotics to grow in our intestines i think that's the very important thing prebiotics helps to probiotics that the one thing oligosaccharides i was i was going through some literature of ganju here of nagaraju okay even, even substances that delay uh, uh, intestinal you know uh, emptying or uh, or provide fiber for example fiber also has been considered to be a prebiotic because that <laughs> promotes growth of probiotics okay. so anything that promotes and stimulates the growth and activity of prebiotics which could be things like fiber also has been uh, you know classified into prebiotic that's only fiber is one of the thing what people used to talk about a lot previously what is postbiotics this is the one thing a lot of people talking about now and uh, anyone can take up 
Oh, pre, uh, pro and postbiotics are similar, but postbiotics are supposed to be killed. You know, uh, ah, yeah. our ENT uh, surgeon talked about the uh, the uh, the importance of killed uh, probiotic bacteria also, and they are helpful. So postbiotics are killed, uh, killed, uh, you know, uh, useful bacteria which can help in spite of them being dead or inactivated because we need we need the proteins on them to activate our immune system uh, to to induce the helpful effects that the probiotics have so those are the postbiotics i think I, you want to add sir anybody yeah, i think postbiotics are these are the uh, product or by product from the metabolism of probiotics so these are the post products and most of the effects of post uh, probiotics are now thought to be due to postbiotics only so it's true that is that definitely whatever the, what the people talked about non viral bacterial products what we are talking about now they are all postbiotics mainly short chain patches which are very very vital for the how to transport these things or in the cell that's why people talk about that nowadays postbiotics uh what is leaky gut what are the factors causing leaky gut uh, doctor i think uh, uh, the Pediatrician can take up with Dr. Gupta. You can take up this because it's a pediatric topic. I think Dr. Gupta is busy, so I think I'll take this up. Okay. So more or less, uh, okay. So leaky gut, probably you know we we don't really address the leaky gut uh, uh, more so in our uh, allopathic uh, practice, but it's more uh, to do with the the altered medicine. They are they they give a lot of significance to the leaky gut. so basically they talk of uh, so it is basically related to the dysbiosis only as a result of which the bacteria basically uh, passes through the walls of uh, the intestine and uh, get into the system so that is basically a leaky gut i think that is the epithelium barrier dysfunction wherever maybe all allergic diseases are due to only epithelial barrier dysfunction that is a gut epithelial dysfunction maybe something it gives way for the things to enter that is one thing what you call as leaky gut in a normal terminology that is where the tight junctions will be released and they can get and as through that they can able to enter so this is why probiotics can enter and can able to plug this holes that that is one of the things only i think same thing what about dysbiosis what are the causes of dysbiosis hello yeah uh, the causes could be more of uh, uh, you know the rapid passage of uh, food in uh, from the uh, intestinal system into the large gut and particularly diarrhea so where you're not able to maintain the uh, gut flora and uh, usually it is either ibd or ibs both could be responsible of course we do have this kind of symptoms in acute uh, manifestation of any diarrheic disease but usually more important are the chronic diseases where the uh, gut flora is ill maintained or difficult to restore for a long period of time yes. and it could be in diabetic enteropathy as well and uh, you know uh, certain uh, pancreatic diseases which is like chronic pancreatitis it's absolutely even, even the lifestyle problems and the westernized <laughs> diet which leads to dysbiosis can lead to a leaky gut yeah yeah that's a very important stress also one of the things what you can talk about nowadays these are the commonly used in us lactobacillus simplifidobacterium people talk about that only everywhere and now you want to talk about because food allergies are increasing is is any link between microbial exposure and food allergy that is the one thing everybody ask about food allergy means microbiota uh, and there is talk about probiotics nobody everybody talk about I think there is a very important link between this. Uh, there have been studies where uh, uh, these probiotics have been used to prevent food allergies. So, and also uh, those patients who have outgrown their food allergy, if they were supplemented with the probiotics, they had very good and uh, longer response as compared to those who were not supplemented. So, there is very important and complex uh, interaction and uh, relation between these two. I think that's only what you talked about already. when he was uh, dr pipu he was mentioning about i think he was telling about this uh, the gut flora is a very important what are the recommendations uh, i think i expect from dr dermatologist 
all about the recommendation probiotic world allergy organization the prevention of eczema this is a thing only organization has given something recommendations in one of the society but not european academy or american academy or allergy nobody they are not given but only this is the only academy has given this thing as prevention and it seems to be good and what do you, uh, what is the recommendation sir yeah dr nagroju as you mentioned that this is a very controversial and uh, gray area and uh, it has not been you know put into the recommendation although there are many studies that now show that supplementation of probiotics helps in uh, you know development of eczema exacerbations in acne psoriasis etc so there are recommendations in people for people who are prone to develop allergies particularly infants born of uh, mothers who have a high risk of allergy who are children who are expected to develop allergy or atop later in life for example they have a family history for example the mother has allergy also so such pregnant women such uh, breastfeeding women and even children in their infancy if they are supplemented with probiotics some of the studies do show that uh, there is prevention of at least severe disease if not complete uh, you know removal of eczema in these children sir which stage of the pregnancy these are the probiotics given usually the terminal part of the pregnancy the third trimester third trimester third trimester and in the first first trimester of the uh, first three years of life of pregnancy and baby born also which type of probiotics they recommend in order any idea uh, uh certain species of lactobacillus and uh, uh, bifidobacteria are recommended lactobacillus particularly rhamnosus uh, and uh, uh I don't remember the other one, and they are they are specific on strains also. They yeah, say yeah. that specific strains like UVLA strains mm -hmm. are more useful than others. UVLA one, two, three, or something like that. It is there definitely because whatever the vaginal flora used to contains that is Lactobacillus uh, and uh, uh, Bifidobacter. That is the only thing they recommend in this. Any role of probiotics in cow's milk allergy, Doctor uh, Mukesh Gupta? Uh, yes, sir. There have been studies where uh, uh, probiotics have been used in patients with cow milk allergy, and they have been shown to be useful. So uh, th there is role, but concrete evidence is still awaited. But I think there is a role. There is uh, there are promising results with the studies available. Now, can you able to replace uh, the treatment, or you want as an adjuvant effect? Uh, at this moment only uh, it is as adjuvant of to the treatment not as replacement to okay i think it works really well for uh, the colics and all which uh, the babies have yeah so rhamnosus nowadays have been used uh, for uh, mainly for the colics yeah rhamnosus gg has got very good effect even for very effective especially at this stage it is not going to stop at especially ig mid but is very Somewhat helpful in the intolerance patients. What is your experience in probiotic allergic rhinitis, ENT, sir? Because you are doing your work on probiotics, we heard that's why we are experienced. We want to know from you. Uh, I am Dr. B. P. Tagi from Gandhi. Yes. Uh, I am using uh, these molecules for one month in allergic rhinitis. Uh, it is doing wonders in. About eight years of age and elderly elderly people, I am giving in baby dose since one month. Uh, so uh, my experience uh, as per time is very less, but uh, it is well tolerated and is doing wonders. Very good, sir. Thank you very much. I have been actually using it for over four years now, and uh, I have been because since the time it was introduced by one of the companies because that is the one which. Uh, Got the same, so this I've been using for four years, and I've been using in a lot of my patients. And uh, with, you know, whenever it normally, sir, as you know, that in allergy we make a allergy chart, an yearly calendar which we make, and we have an idea that around what uh, month the patient is going to have more of a problem. So I normally what I do is a month before that uh, issue and a month after that issue. So suppose my patient I know is going to have a problem somewhere around November, December. I'm going to start off uh, in October. And I'm going to continue till the middle of uh, January. So about 30, 90 days, or maybe four months, I give uh, the patient. And what I've seen over last uh, four years is that there has been 
much much reductions in the exacerbations so those who used to have uh, exacerbations during that period they have been able to sail through pretty well i think uh, so my experience think, uh, has been uh, pretty long with the, these patients yes, so we are using also quite uh, effectively but the thing is that if you are using only just one month before and after one month of the season how they are at age 2 to th1 will occur and i totally like did this i don't know if you need it go trials to prove in india at all what strains normally helpful to you sir the tagi sir uh it is uh, lactobacillus hello it is lactobacillus lactobacillus paracaceae yeah yeah paracaceae i think dr vibhu you are using lot you are telling what strains normally use it hello Pardon? what strains normally what type i think i i went i went so okay so the paracaceae the the two strains which are clearly available the the combination of the aap2 which is available the same is available across companies and i've been using the same strain so yeah. that is what i've been using i've not been trying to experiment too much with my patients because apart from the allergy i do general pediatrics too so it works uh, uh, so whatever patients i get i don't get very very severe cases of allergies but whatever cases i get i do add on and sometimes what happens that uh, once you have given uh, say montelukast and the patient is still not completely under control if you just add this aap to it the patient gets into a controlled zone so i have been able to you know uh, save steroids uh, the high doses of steroids in such patients i think that's the only thing could i could i add uh, professor yeah, yeah. nagraj huya yeah. so so i think if we cut across various discussions and the literature uh, probiotics as a preventive would definitely be an add on therapy and they would work better than placebo and they would appeal better to uh, people because in indian context we have lot of association with in gut and all the diseases if my gut seems to be working fine i am seem to be doing pretty well so they are definitely add ons and they work better than placebo and if at all uh, we have something left over to add on to our resistance type of phenotypes of allergic induced asthma uh, or sorry allergic rhinitis which are so severe that the patient tells you in his face that he really wants to get rid of his nose because he's just not able to tolerate i think uh, the literature also supports that we can use these uh, probiotics uh, as uh, dr vibhu pointed out a month or at least 45 days prior to the allergy onset season which would be classically in the first to second week of march and continue in the harvesting season because that is the time we get lot of allergies during the wheat harvesting season around 14th of april and continue till about 30th april add on to montelukast and intranasal corticosteroids i think that should be an a perfect combination i think this is a wonderful study done by us two they separate separate study the meta analysis they shows the very huge data i think they are telling that with the lactobacillus species and bifidobacter both are different different they use the thing is that uh, how long to use not known how much to give or not known that is the biggest drawback otherwise there is definitely pH to pH will be there improvement of the at present i feel that we can use it as a adjuvant therapy so i would like to comment here that yeah, since, yeah, please. since demolition takes only a little time and the building takes very long time similarly uh, destruction of our health takes very short time and building takes long time so if you want to build our healthy bacteria it will be longer so i think it will be as longer is better So at least three months we should use, and okay. beyond, if possible, we should use. So at least three to six month period is better to develop the because we have seen that antibiotics can uh, cause dysbiosis for years together. So if you are not supplementing after using antibiotics, a person may be in uh, dysbiosis for two, three, four years. I think so longer, longer is better. Yeah, yeah. It is high time for the Indian studies to come out. Very cool, sir. And release us, and we can talk about our personal experience. Different, our uh, study is different. That's the only biggest study. Madam, six is the one. Can you explain the gut skin axis, sir? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, Dr. Webu had explained the the importance of a healthy gut uh, and the development of uh, skin allergies, particularly atopic eczema. Uh, this is related to what is known as hygiene hypothesis for development of atopic dermatitis, where it is said that if the uh, gut, uh, the, if there is gut dysbiosis, there is a possibility of switching of uh, you know uh, Th1 to Th2 response, and Th Two response is an allergic response which is associated with high IgE levels, development of high IgE levels, uh, cytokines that promote. It's a pro-inflammatory state, which cytokines produces cytokines that promote eczema and skin allergies. So that's why if the gut flora are not healthy, there is dysbiosis. There is a likelihood of more severe disease developing, and an atopic march, as it is called, can happen. Uh, that sir, have you used? Uh, your experience in atopic dermatitis because it's a very tough nowadays. We are seeing a lot of very tough uh, atopic dermatitis, severe atopic dermatitis patients in our practice. Now we are getting reference. See, uh, atopic dermatitis has, has multi multiple factors involved in, in its pathogenesis. In immune system dis disturbance is only one part of it. We have a disturbed uh, skin barrier, which is the most important factor in the development of eczema. And these people are deficient in certain uh, substances within the skin barrier, like ceramides and uh, filagrin degradation products or moisture, natural moisturizing factors. In addition to that, there is an immune disbalance, which is Th1 to Th2 you know, shift. So, uh, no, I have not used uh, probiotics very extensively in atopic dermatitis because it has always been a very controversial issue. But now some of the studies are showing and it has not been recommended in, in most of our you know, recommendations for treatment of atopic dermatitis. But then I see studies now uh, which have come in which are showing uh, definite improvement over placebo in, in children who have been given it, particularly in the first year of life to prevent development of eczema in the later years of life. And I, I intend to use it more often in my patients now. I think that's a very good one. I think the Fidobacterium amnosa studies has showed so much improvement in the studies automatically. But recommendations uh, are not yet mentioned, except that prevention part, otherwise treatment part recommendation has not come up to now. Sir, uh, I think, uh, uh, and you, sir, I think you want to know about your experience of using probiotic in asthma patients. Have any use in any way? So again, uh, uh, I think the studies are limited. Uh, but uh, it stems from the fact that uh, uh, about uh, 70 to 99 percent of patients have allergic rhinitis and allergic rhinitis figures as one of the prominent causes of severe persistent asthma. So if we want to decrease the severity of a persistent asthma, which is increasing from really we see about now as my practice about five to seven percent of patients going into severe persistent asthma. And uh, we should be using more and more probiotics, particularly in prevention of allergic rhinitis, which in turn would be a comorbidity treated well, or at least, uh, you know, down regulating the immune response would be applicable also to asthma, shifting from, you know, TH1 to TH2 balance to a normal, you know, balance. And there are uh, uh, quite a number of studies, but the uh, P-value is not very, very significant in terms of evaluation of efficacy. But uh, as more studies come, I think uh, uh, the longer duration of probiotics may be helpful in uh, preventing and uh, decreasing the symptoms of asthma, as has been case in other diseases like allergic rhinitis. I think what you told is correct, because allergic rhinitis, if you're able to treat it, the Severity of asthma will come down. That's why one by four times it will be increased because you also with allergic rhinitis. Four times. May I add something? It can yeah. reduce it. That is one of the things. As such, asthma alone is what any thing as per the latest literature is coming. And if you want, uh, what about uh, Muke? You want to add? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I use probiotics in those asthmatics who are either obese or those who are eating excessive processed food, which is lacking uh, prebiotics. And also in those patients who are taking frequent antibiotics or who have uh, recently taken antibiotics. So if they are having poor control, then also I use uh, probiotics in them. Okay, what uh, Sarah has told about is using in allergic and associated asthma, you are telling obesity. And other related things you are using that maybe that thing allergy asthma. Allergy. Uh, I think uh, I 
uh, one of uh, a very senior uh, uh, gastroenterologist. I think you must have heard the name Dr. Neelam Mohan. She is a very well-known uh, periodic gastro. So she had once mentioned that, you know, your gut is actually a second brain. You know, it has so many nerves. It is it is such a complex thing as, as, as your brain. So you can almost connect everything to your gut also. And, uh, you know, one of my professors way back in my, during my MBBS times used to say, that in Hindustan, if you have a lot of people in Hindustan, so unki life वैसे ही उनकी आधी से ज़्यादा problems खत्म हो जाती हैं. So I think we are actually going towards that only that you know that ultimately the gut is being connected to the skin, the gut is being connected to the allergic rhinitis and uh, now to asthma also. So we are actually it's not uh, we are connecting. It is just that over last 20 years the food habits have tremendously changed. You know if if I tell my patient ke aap apne bacche ko, suppose you don't give uh, Maggie and uh, a few more uh, momos and stuff you know ultimately the parent the way he looks at you the parent asks you what will my child have I mean it's it those that is the kind of society we are facing nowadays and probably that could also be the reason for the dysbiosis and eventually the rise in the allergy allergic diseases which we are having it that there is a lot of access, gut, brain access, gut, lung access, light skin access is so much in there. A lot of things is coming out, but still a lot of uh, societies has not come out because of lack of proper studies. Can you explain the gut, lung access, sir? We can able to talk about something. Uh, we've already, I think, touched upon the gut, lung access. And uh, basically, the dysbiosis uh, increases the pathogen multiplication and it alters the immune response and it alters the microflora of the uh, gut and probably the leaky gut syndrome. So you have more of a, a imbalance of TH1 to TH2 and it causes tissue damage. So once you improve the microflora of the gut, the immune response is boosted and they, uh, the no normal diversity also improves the uh, pear patches inflammation. And therefore, there is less uh, IgE production and also the uh, T helper cells, which are uh, more of TH2, uh, they move in another direction. So, uh, but the choice of the uh, uh, bacteria which are associated with restoration of gut uh, microflora has to be correct, as Dr. Vibhu pointed out by pointing that lactobacillus, two different types are available in adequate quantity, whether it's uh, alive or heat killed or heat stable, uh, it is usually does not matter. And as Dr. Mukesh pointed out, it should be long enough to build up the right amount of uh, uh, immune balance and sustainable immune balance to maintain that kind of a, uh, you know, U biases. Then only things will take shape. But the thing is that after replacing the gut, with this, this is not healing. That's the only thing. Damage is going on. The only thing we are not, we are not able to see the practically, uh, especially in the lung. That is the one thing. What is still we have to prove it. Yeah, to it. Uh, when are prescribing? I think what is the important thing is what you look for. Normally, they, uh, I think you can take up this issue that when you want to prescribe this thing, I think anyone can take. Mukesh, you can take up this. So it is very important to be yeah. strain so specific because many times if you are using other species, the, the effect which are desired may not be there. So we have to be strain specific and also we need to look at the formulations available because uh, many times live bacteria may not be stable in serum formulations. So it is very important to uh, be strain specific and as well as formulations. So what is the mention is the strain specific, whatever you want to use because dental they are using, resinosis, bacterial resinosis people are using, so many other conditions for brain they are using. So it has to be a strain specific, then only it will be works. That's only everything is talking about. We have to wait for a long, long time to come about all these things. When it will be approved by the, our societies, we have to wait. And provided to has any side effects, a lot of people think probiotics is present in our body only, cause any side effects. But what about your experience you are using all the time, so many times, and you have to find anybody who is coming back to you with any side effects? Sir, I think side effects are almost similar. What the side effects we have, ICS for asthma. 
तो नेग्लिजिबल साइड इफेक्ट एंड स्पेशली इफ वी बैलेंस विद द बेनिफिट्स तो दीज आर कुड बी लाइक इंटेस्टिनल ब्लोटिंग फेटुलेंस एटसेट्रा बट नॉट सीरियसली वी आर नॉट सीइंग इन आवर प्रैक्टिस ऑलमोस्ट नेग्लिजिबल या आई थॉट आई एम आल्सो यूजिंग फॉर द पास्ट सेवरल इयर्स व्हेन फर्स्ट टाइम इट इज कम टू इंडिया But I am not finding any much people talk about this diarrhea, bloating, and I am not seeing it in my practice also. Can we uh, in steroid patients? Can we do patients on steroid? Because it is very common in allergic patients, especially atopic dermatitis area, and uh, allergic rhin asthma. Asthma is a very common where you have to use a lot of steroids. People ask, and we have to use the steroids. Uh, yes, I think stands to reason to probably. Uh, you know, as an adjuvant to probably reduce the dose of uh, oral corticosteroids in a long term, because uh, if we are able to achieve that kind of a end result, it would be a wonderful uh, achievement both for the patient as for us, because finally we do want to reduce the oral corticosteroid, and if uh, uh, they are taking care of. Uh, Uh, you know the comorbid factors in asthma and allergic rhinitis particularly as dr mukesh pointed out that obese asthmatics or patients who are uh, having antibiotics for their control of asthma so we have a subset phenotype where it is neutrophilic dependent which are more responsive to like antibiotics and obesity which are kind of resistant asthmatic so if we are then using probiotics in these kind of subsets of patients and downsizing or you know uh, getting them a step down then they are better managed so i think it stands to very good reason and that should be promoted as an independent you know um, indication for use of probiotics in uh, asthma or in allergic rhinitis that is the one thing what you are aware of there is a use for long term steroids want to reduce the dose of steroids i think it is very useful and uh, provide definitely will bring it down that's good point to talk about that. what a lot of people talk about you know compromise patients in india a lot of malnutrition all the people with so many chemotherapy and all their thing is going any problem will be there with the people with the renal transplant and the solid transplants and all now you find anything in this type of patients what type of probiotic to be given what type of probiotic not to be given in this type of patients a lot of patients will ask us this thing anyone can take up this you should be able to tell us better sir yeah that is what i that if you want to ask me i will tell you that because we are practicing but thing i think when i had a diarrhea myself i am taking my tacrolimus and all and people told me not to take anything but i took the lactobacillus i am telling you frankly because it's not caused anything though it is written in ectremia endocardial meningitis i am not saying lactobacillus is nothing but only thing it is very simple and different bacteria these two things which are living for the uh, for long long time in vagina and other flora and all these things i think I, we are more worried about rather than prescribing the probiotic especially of course there is in three terms when we use bacillus plazas they may be septicemia they mentioned otherwise we won't see much especially in that but you have to be very careful when you are using lactobacillus yeah. in a patient with so i think uh, here uh, we are going to have a more role of uh, killed uh, bacteria and killed probiotics that is going to come into play then but you have to be very careful milk allergy which is very common and lactobacillus i saw my patient treated in apollo and we have to decide after one day only that's a very important thing you have to keep in mind <sighs> probiotics generally i think Uh, safe, nothing to worry about this thing, and uh, uh, there is not much hypersensitive probiotics as such. We are, we are, our mind is more sensitive to that. That's why we have to be more adjustable to probiotics. That's only I feel it. In the role of probiotics in recurrent respiratory in children, we see a lot of recurrent respiratory infection nowadays. People send to the children to the uh, as early as one year, one and a half year to the. Pre school, pre school, whatever the schools are there, new names are coming out, and they are very, very prone to that. It causes a lot of problem to the parents. They are not able to go to the their work, and the child is uh, sick. That is the biggest thing. What and any role is there, Doctor Mukesh? Sir, there is enough literature which suggests that those patients who had severe Klebsiella pneumonia or pneumococcus pneumonia 
or who had uh, recurrent episodes of infection respiratory infection they had altered lung uh, microbiota and also there is one meta analysis which was published last year only it suggests that if these patient are supplemented with probiotics uh, their uh, frequency of infection is reduced so definitely there is role uh, the strength of evidence is not very strong but definitely in coming years we shall have that but uh, there are promising results of uh, anybody wants to add i think what is that thing is we are sending the babies there more of a rhinovirus is very common to which can catch us 192 zero types is going on that's why lactoplast and gg or lactoplast casey they are the people who are nowadays trying in the elder younger patients lactoplast gg older patients they are trying a lot of trials are going on but we need a lot of research before conclusions at all and uh, i think this is a wonderful discussion for all of you i think we had a, any questions we are ready to take up but before wind up this session i'll tell you that there are a lot of evidence is there probiotics and allergic diseases and a lot of uh, gaining momentum on this and everybody looking into the uh, probiotics nowadays everybody peeping in that then you can i use it every specialty not only uh, allergies or immunology but also the cardiologists they are using everywhere they are using the primary prevention also become now approved by who for prevention of eczema which can start as a uh, dr parmesh told atopic march and we stop seven secondary prevention from allergic rhinitis and uh, for food allergies and all can not able to happen from uh, eczema to that thing that is also very useful but when you are prescribing better to have a strain specific that is very important future uh, research is needed still especially indian research i think i request the pharmaceutical companies to take up this research and a lot of people are using collect the data and make it as a uh, thing and analyze it and put it in the black and white people have got confidence on this thank you very much for this opportunity given any questions we are ready to take up thank you anybody any questions <laughs> Uh, sir, I think most of the questions are covered. There is only one question, possibly that what age it can be given, referring to the antiallergic probiotic. So, what is the recommended age or the? Uh... So, I am using it uh, above uh, two years of age. I think even so, and lot of this uh, lacto lacto bacillus and amnosis gg drops are also available nowadays and are, drops are also available that's right and children also we are giving there is no hard and fast this rule you have to give for this child and that child this age at all old age you can give younger age also you can give there is no thing is there and even pre terms also a lot of people are trying to prevent the uh, that uh, huh? nec cash wants to tell something huh? nec and, People are already using to prevent in NEC necrotizing enterocolitis. Enterocolitis. So, perhaps we can use in neonatal period. We are using this uh, for prevention of NEC also. There is no hard and fast rule to particular age to be given. And uh, I think we book anything. No, sir. Thank you. Uh, basically, why I mentioned two years was because mostly it's uh, actually the BFNI says they exclusive breastfeed up to two years or up to six months, and then after that also you should continue no animal product, no external products as far as possible up to two years of age. So probably you know respecting them also, I think two years become a very safe zone where you can uh, you know intermingle with the uh, intestine. Otherwise, it's basically individualized based, and you can use it earlier also because nowadays they are bringing, mm -hmm. as you have rightly mentioned, the lactobacillus GG drops have also come. So now they are using it at much much lower age. Yes. One thing is that six six months is exclusive breastfeeding or close. Exclusive breastfeeding. Uh, what I said was that the animal products and other products is up to two years. They are saying. That's not to intermingle with the intestine too much before two years. Yes, uh, the American Academy of Allergy, Clinical Immunology, and American Academy of Pediatrics recommends at six months of age, uh, animal products can be given to the patients. Now, let us, but it will can, let it come to the end. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the panelists who are talking very well and spoke all of you, all the doubts clear by the thing we have given some. Uh, think about the probiotics to the public. I think that's a wonderful thing, and it's good. I think now I hand over the mic to uh, we. Uh,
Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have not much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for this uh, excellent, uh, uh, I would say, confluence that has happened of uh, various specialities and various uh, experience coming together for this discussion. Uh, I think uh, it couldn't have been uh, a better uh, platform for us to come together and discuss on allergy as a broad topic and then come to the uh, gut microbiome and finally the role of probiotics is the same. Uh, uh, it, it's still an evolving concept and hence more and more research is required uh, with individualized experience as well as uh, a lot of clinical research and papers as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the uh, panelists today, the speakers, um, especially Dr. Nagraju for kind of uh, moderating the session so uh, so very well. And thanks to all the... No, you want me to be able to do it. I thank you so much um, and to all the participants who have also joined in today uh, thank you so much for taking our time for this scientific discussion we hope that it's been a value addition to your practice as well as to your patients and last but not the least, we request you to take care of yourselves, your loved ones, and your patients during these testing times. Thank you so much for joining in, and have a good Thank day. You all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you all. I have to join the uh, Bangalore Pediatric Society now. Okay. Inaugural session at seven o'clock. I think the permission already gone. Thank you. Thank you. Webinar. Thank you, so Thank you sir. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.